So without further ado, please make welcome Andrew from WeatherTix. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you, fans. Okay, so I'm back. And I did promise you that this one would be a bit more interesting. So hopefully I can live up to my promise. Address, addressing condensation and mould in stud wall construction. It sounds exciting because it is. Um, now, who's heard of leaky building syndrome or sick building syndrome in New Zealand? Yep. So this is where this particular CPD has come from. Um, let's wait till this gentleman's finished on the phone. Okay. Um, so basically, probably about 15 years ago in New Zealand, they discovered that when they were doing alterations and additions on mainly homes, taking cladding off or taking internal lining off, they found that there was mould actually growing inside the uh, bulk insulation in the walls. And some of the cases were so bad that they thought, wow, look at all this mould. There must be a leak in here somewhere. And in case, some cases there were leaks, but in a lot of cases there weren't leaks. And so where was this moisture coming from? So they discovered through various testing and observations that whilst uh, leaks were sometimes the culprit, quite often it was condensation actually getting inside the walls, not being able to escape, eventually being in there long enough to create mould. So they decided to no longer call it uh, leaky building syndrome, but sick building syndrome. And uh, that's where this particular CPD has come from. We've been talking about this at WeatherTex for about 10 years. Indeed, the original version of this CPD, which has recently been updated in line with the latest NCC rules, uh, is about 10 years old. So um, we're going to look at the factors contributing to increased condensation. I guess, is it increased condensation or is it just condensation getting into the wall and not being able to get out again? We'll look at the risks and possible damage caused by mould. We'll look at the science behind condensation and vapour. Where does that come from? We'll look at the two-step design solution, um, which addresses the issue. And we'll also look at how the R values are affected by that two-step design solution. So hands up, has anyone in the room been involved in maybe alterations and additions on a class one home? and they've taken cladding off or linings off and found mould inside the walls. Has that happened? The lady at the back has, yep. A couple of you are nodding. I think I know you too. Um, anyway, um, basically, this is what we're talking about. And when I think back to the house that I grew up in, I grew up in northwestern Sydney in a suburb called Thornley, up near Hornsby. And um, my parents built a house there in 1966, which was very much a house built to a standard and, um, uh, excuse me, built to a price, not a standard. And it was a log cabin fibro clad home, asbestos cement, as it all was in those days. You know, concrete tile roof, tongue and groove flooring, ranch style, L-shaped lounge dining, three bedroom, one bathroom, you know the style. There was millions probably of, the, of that particular style of house built through the 50s and 60s, probably right up to the 70s. And how much insulation was in that home in 1966? Zero, nothing, exactly. So um, we also had enormous picture windows that faced due west with a tiny little eave over that. And in the, in the summer, in the afternoons, you come home from school and the heat load on that glass, which incidentally was about five mil float glass, as we discovered when the cricket ball went through the front window one time and great shards of glass came raining down and we're thinking, gee, it's a good thing we weren't standing under that. There was no safety glass in those days, and I think safety glass is still optional in class one homes, I'm not sure. Um, anyway, so, what's that? Depends on the size of the window, yeah, yeah, and the application, because I know bathrooms, you have to have safety glass, but in, in those days, these were 1.5 by 2.4 huge windows, and they were pretty dangerous. So, no insulation, and the house was very hot in summer and very cold in winter. And being up in that northwest sort of part of Sydney, about 30 k's from the coast, it gets pretty cool up there in winter. So if we fast forward to about 1972, I remember crawling through the roof space and handing Dad these pink bats that he put down in between all the rafters to try and create a bit more insulation. And um, about the same actually probably a few years before that, to try and heat the place in winter. We put in one of those Vulcan oil heaters, you know, the dancing flames and the flue that went up through the roof. That was fantastic until the oil crisis of the early 70s and heating costs went through the roof and we no longer use that. Um, and Dad also put in an air conditioner in the mid-70s, which was one of those big box things. 
And, um, you know, you'd turn it on and the lights would go dim because this thing used to suck the juice and, you know, all conversation would cease because it was so noisy, but the temperature would drop. But I still remember that first summer when he got the electricity bill. I think that was the last time we used it. And we, we looked around and there was no insulation in the walls. We had put insulation in the ceiling. There were gaps under doors, single glazing, the houses weren't built particularly well. There were vents in walls too. Either side of those picture windows, we had vents in the walls to enable air to circulate through the walls to keep everything dry. Um, so we kind of, I think, around about 20, 21 years ago, we started to th rethink about how we were designing our homes. And a lot of the push from that was because a lot more people were travelling overseas going to places in the Northern Hemisphere where you have double glazing, triple glazing, very highly insulated walls. I remember being in a house in Germany and you closed the door and the seals were such that the acoustics changed in the room and you could actually feel that it was a tight air seal. And uh, we also, um, uh, around about 2000, not only were we travelling over to those places, seeing how houses were built overseas, coming back to our cardboard boxes and wondering, mm, you know, maybe we could improve this a bit. We also started installing more split system air conditioners as well around about that time. And uh, people like Dad were getting their bills after running their air conditioner for that first summer season and going, wow, you know, this thing's expensive to run. And they look around at the gaps under the doors and the single glazing and the vents in walls and go, hang on, we're trying to air condition the neighbourhood here. So the government, in their infinite wisdom, decided to make homes more thermally efficient. And so uh, we started to include, started to mandate uh, sarking or building wraps as an additional kind of um, defence against rain should the cladding be breached. We no longer put vents in walls or in eaves. We kind of sealed everything up. We started putting insulation, started mandating insulation in our roofs and in our walls. And um, we introduced R values for the performance of walls, SHGC and U values for the performance of windows. And we came up in New South Wales with the BASIC system. So we decided to make buildings more airtight, more thermally efficient, but we'd forgotten some of the lessons we'd learnt years before around you know, avoiding condensation. Um, this, this issue is, um, is, is really more relevant to colder climates, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But if we look at um, the trends around the world, we look at, you know, Canada, UK, Europe, Japan, USA, they're all much quicker coming to the party in terms of making their homes more thermally efficient. Why do you think that is when you consider say, most of Canada's climate versus maybe Sydney's climate, what's the big difference? Bloody cold over there, isn't it? You know, in, in winter, Canadians tend to heat their whole home um, for, for the winter. They probably start their heating in, you know, early to mid-autumn or fall, as they call it there, and they run their heating continuously until probably late spring because the temperatures get so low over there that if they didn't, they'd probably freeze to death. You know, it's pretty cold, minus 20 in the depths of winter over there. So they have a very different climate compared to, say, Sydney. They need to have very well insulated homes. Australia and New Zealand were much later in coming to the party. We see around about 20 odd years ago, we started to be a bit more focused on this. I think we can still maybe push it a bit further. But that $29 billion repair bill that you see for New Zealand is what they think it's going to cost in total to fix the New Zealand housing stock that have this sick building syndrome issue. So if we cast our minds back to Thorn Lee in the 1970s, some of you weren't even born, um, but uh, you walked into the bathroom in those days and it was quite common in those days to walk into a bathroom, virtually no bathrooms had mechanical ventilation, and what would be growing on the ceiling? Mould. It's just, it happened everywhere. I said this recently to a group of young people and one of them was an American and, and he was like, oh my God, that's disgusting. And it's like, well, you know, we're talking back the old days here, you know, 50 odd years ago. We didn't know that mould was bad for you then. We probably didn't work out until the, the 80s that mould has tiny little spores that float through the air and get into your lungs and can cause problems. So um, I remember again in the sort of mid to late 70s, dad put in a Mistral exhaust fan, Mistral became quite big in Australia at that time, promoting their exhaust fans. And all that did is it just took the steam up into the roof space and it probably got mouldy up there. Um, he tried to clean the mould off the bathroom ceiling and it, it 
it's, it, it's impossible. Once it's in plasterboard, that's it. So he wallpapered over the whole thing with bright orange and green flowers, which contrasted beautifully with the uh, baby blue tiles. People would walk into that bathroom and go, oh, oh, you'd hear them for the first time, go, oh, wow, love the wallpaper. Um, but anyway, eventually the, the mould grew through the wallpaper again and we just gave up. If you can see it, you can deal with it. You can try and deal with it if it hasn't been left for too long. But sometimes it occurs inside in the building fabric. And if we talk about condensation or mould inside something, it's interstitial condensation or interstitial mould. And it just means in this case, it's inside the wall cavities. Um, and here it says interstitial condensation can be the result of incorrect use of thermal insulation intended to stop surface condensation. That's not true. The thermal insulation is intended to make the building more thermally efficient and the interstitial condensation slash mould is a result of poor wall design. And so condensation gets into that wall, gets into the insulation, gets stuck there and goes mouldy. So that's what we're trying to avoid here. Um, so mould and risks, risks and possible damage. We've talked about this sick building syndrome. Mould spores get into the, the lungs of the very young, the very old, and people with lung conditions and can create problems. If we can't see it and it's hidden, we don't know it's there, we can't deal with it. And if we um, basically leave it for long enough, we, it can lead to structural problems. Uh, Mouldy studs can eventually rot and then of course they might lose their structural integrity. And there's little creatures that love eating um, mouldy and wet wood because it's easier for them to digest. Termites, they love it. So if we look at this image here and we can see, as my, point, my point is not that powerful, but we can see there's quite a bit of mould happening here around the steel strut. Back to the bathroom, 1970s, it's a, it's a cool night and anyone, I don't want you to think of me, just think of anybody's having a hot shower in that bathroom in the 1970s and uh, the, the, the warm water is coming down from the, from the spout and then steam is rising up from that warm water because the air's cooler, the water's warmer, it's producing steam and the steam then will hit the cool ceiling and because the ceiling is cooler, there's a, a difference in temperature and the steam condenses from a gas to a liquid and creates condensation, little water droplets sitting on the ceiling. So that's what's causing the mould in a, a non-mechanically ventilated bathroom on a cooler uh, winter's day or night. So the reason why we've got a bit more mould, and looking at these bricks, I'd say this house was probably built you know, 20, 30 years ago. There are a lot of people that were insulating their walls prior to it being mandatory, um, so even though this house might be 30, 30 plus years old, by the look of those bricks, it was insulated obviously from day one. And when they've taken off the cladding to do some alts and adds, we see that there's quite a bit more mould activity happening around that steel strut. A bit like the bathroom ceiling, the steel strut's cooler. So I'm gonna tell you how the condensation gets into the wall shortly, but it gets in there, hits that steel strut, and it condenses from a gas to a liquid, and it stays wet for long enough and goes mouldy. And you can see down the bottom too that the liquids kind of, due to gravity, come down quite a bit and, um, and gathered on the bottom and created mould. So this is what we're trying to avoid. We don't want mouldy walls. So how does the vapour move and get into the wall? Well, um, plasterboard is surprisingly permeable to water vapour. When we look at plasterboard, it's two sheets of paper and in between there's gypsum, which is a byproduct of sugar refining, I believe. And that gypsum um, has lots of little holes in it, if you look at it under a microscope. And the paper does too. And we're gonna compare plasterboard to other building materials shortly and show the permeability of it. It's surprisingly permeable. We can also have air leakage um, around uh, the wall, wherever we have a GPO or a light switch or an air conditioning controller, there's normally a penetration and then there's a plate uh, that goes over that, but it's a, it's a point of weakness. And this little comment here, nearly 30 litres of water can be collected through air leakage through a 6.5 centimetre square hole at 40 degrees relative humidity, 21 degrees Celsius. What is missing from this equation to make it meaningful? Time, what are we talking here? A week, a month, a year, an hour, a day? Um, I'm assuming it's probably 
a year. I don't know. But as I said, this was written a long time ago. Nobody knows. It's been lost in the annals of time. But suffice to say that air leakage through these penetrations is an issue as well. So we're going to look at a couple of models now to show you the science behind this and how does vapour get into the walls in the first place. So vapour pressure is higher inside than outside. So where does the vapour come from? Now, if we were in a more enclosed room than this, so say we're on a, a 2.7 high ceiling and it's all fairly well sealed because it's a winter's day, so we've got the doors closed, we've got the windows closed, we might have a draft, a draft excluder or a sausage underneath the door to stop any cool air from coming in. So we've done our best. We've got our curtains drawn probably as well. We've done our best to make the room airtight and cosy and people, we breathe in oxygen and plus a bunch of other chemicals, and we breathe out carbon dioxide, plus a bunch of other chemicals. And that air that we breathe out is moisture laden because we're made up mainly of water. So I'm breathing in and then breathing out moisture laden air. So our vapour um, is coming from the air that's being exhaled. Vapour can also come from um, heating as well, be it an electric heater, not so much reverse cycle air conditioning, that tends to dry out the air, um, but an electric radiator, a gas heater, especially a non-fluid gas heater, which has been banned in some legislations, they pump out carbon dioxide, they suck in oxygen, a bit like us, and they um, also put moisture back into the air as well. A lot of people like gas heating for that reason because it keeps the air moist, but you're getting vapour from your heat source as well. And we're also talking about a time of year. You'll notice here that on the inside, we've got artificial heating, so around 22 degrees Celsius and on the outside it's about zero which is pretty cold by Sydney standards and so we have this situation now and I'll go to the next slide same scenario so we've got our cladding on the outside come on a little spotty cladding on the outside sarking our studs our plasterboard on the inside we've got our vapor drive here and it's pushing through the supplies surprisingly permeable plasterboard into the cavity. It's cooler in that cavity than it is in the room. So it'll hit the back of the sarking and it'll hit that cooler surface and it'll condense from a gas to a liquid and create um, condensation. Now, if we, if we have nothing in that wall, and we might even have an air vent, if it was the house I grew up in, there'd be no insulation like we see here. That house didn't even have sarking and there'd be air vents in there, it's just going to evaporate, dry out and disappear. But when we add our bulk insulation and we close up those vents, we no longer have the vents anymore and we sort of sealed the whole system, the moisture gets pushed through um, the plasterboard into the insulation, which is thousands of little fibreglass fibres all interlaced and there's a lot of air in there as well. Um, so it hits that cooler insulation and condenses and makes the insulation wet, and if wet for long enough, it goes mouldy. Something I didn't mention as well, which I should have mentioned earlier about vapour drive, it's all about vapour pressure being higher inside than outside because we're in the room and the heating's in the room. Think of it this way. If I get a balloon and I blow a balloon up but I don't tie the end off, if I let go, the balloon will just release that pressure until there's an equalisation between the pressure on the outside of the balloon and the inside of the balloon. That's basic physics. If we're in a sealed room with a bunch of people and a heater going and vapour pressure's higher inside that room than outside, it's going to want to try and get out to a, an outside area where it can equalise. So if there's gaps under doors or cracks in windows or whatever, it'll go through there, but it'll also push through the plasterboard. So that's, that's how the, the pressure's higher in the inside and that's how it gets into the walls. We're now going to look, the next couple of slides, we're looking at vapour resistance and vapour permeability. So if we look at these different materials, it's measuring vapour resistance in meganewton seconds per gram. I think I'll go back to this one. Meganewton seconds per gram. Has anyone heard of a meganewton second per gram before? No, it's uh, one of those nice engineering terms. So if we look at these, these uh, rendered foams, XPS, expanded polystyrene or extruded polystyrene, these have a high level of vapour resistance. They're very bad breathers. Uh, gloss paint has a high level of vapour resistance, but we love that about gloss paint because the way it protects the surface to which it's applied is by creating a film or a coating, provided that's intact. It'll stop air getting to the surface and thereby stop it from 
corroding, breaking down, whatever. So that's how gloss paint works. We'll come down here to a perforated breather foil. So this is your old sizolation type foil sarking. We still use these types of foils in roofs, I believe, um, but they were also used in the past as a sarking in walls. Even though it's called a breather foil because it has holes perforated in it maybe at 300 centres throughout the, the foil, it doesn't breathe as well as 12.5 millimetre thick plywood. So when you imagine plywood is cross-ply laminated, 12.5 mil thick, that can't breathe particularly well, and neither does the foil. We'll come down here to glass fibre. That's 100 millimetre glass fibre, that should be. Not 100 metre glass fibre, that'd be quite thick. Um, but that's a relatively low level of vapour resistance. Same with 13 mil plasterboard. Emulsion paint, which is your typical two coat over primer paint system you'd see on a plasterboard wall. They're all relatively uh, good breathers. They have low vapour resistance. And then we have our vapour permeable membrane, as the gentleman was mentioning earlier in the earlier presentation. A vapour permeable membrane is a, a relatively new to the Australian market. It's probably been on the market for maybe 10 years, but it's a, it's a different type of sarking. We're gonna demonstrate how it works shortly, but it's a sarking that will still create a secondary defence against rainwater from the outside, but will allow the building to breathe from the inside. And so the first step in our two-step design solution to overcome this issue is to throw out the old foils, the old sarkings, and use a vapour permeable membrane. And we're talking about products like uh, CSR Bradford have a product called Enviroseal. There's Tyvek, you see it on all those American renovation shows, which I sadly became addicted to for a while. Um, there's Proctor Wrap. There's a company called um, Thermocraft, who have a product which I think is brilliantly named um, Watergate as their sarking. And there's a Metalin who has this product called Brains. But you can go to Bunnings and you can buy these vapour permeable membranes. And a lot of building companies now actually brand them uh, with their, their building company name. So we just looked at um, resistance. Let's look at the opposite now at permeability. And so we've got our three traditional types of sarkings that have been around for a long time. As you can see, they have low levels of permeability, whereas a vapour permeable membrane has a very high level of permeability in comparison. That's from the inside out. It breathes from the inside out. If you're wanting to write a performance solution around this, there is an Australian standard which is now referred to in the National Construction Code Volume 2, and it calls up a membrane that complies with AS4200.1, and it's a class 4 membrane. And it has vapour resistance not exceeding 0.5 meganewton seconds per gram. And all of those brands of uh, vapour permeable membrane I mentioned, such as Enviroseal, you know, um, Watergate, Proctor Wrap, Tyvek, they all have a, a resistance of around 0.25 meganewton seconds per gram. So they're good breathers. So I'll just touch on some of these. We look at an aluminium foil sarking. The object of this slide is the green dot should be as far to the right as possible and the grey line should be as far to the left as possible, indicating if you have a low resistance and a high permeability. And you can see here aluminium foil sarking is the opposite it has a, um, a high resistance and a low permeability. We come down here to a vapour permeable membrane and it has a low resistance and a high permeability. That's what we want, that's what we're looking for. How much vapour can pass through 10 square metres in a day? In a vapour permeable membrane, six and a half litres versus 30 mils for the old foils. And how long would it take for a litre of vapour to pass through 10 square metres? under four hours for a vapour permeable membrane versus over a month for the old foils. So as we can see, um, these vapour permeable membranes are the go. So this very suspect looking device um, is a way of demonstrating how these things work. Because remember that the prime function, primary function of a sarking is to provide a secondary weather defence in case the cladding gets breached. Um, so this sarking would be vertically wrapped around the outside of your studs, sort of creating like a raincoat. And you always want the writing to be on the outside because if the writing's on the outside, you know you've put it up the right way. Because as this thing's gonna demonstrate shortly, and oops, hopefully all you guys can see this. This top chamber, I'm gonna put some water in and the bottom chamber, we shouldn't see any water dripping through. And that's the, I guess the primary function of sarking is to create that raincoat layer on the outside of the stud. So 
Our front row people can testify that there's nothing dripping through. This is a very low pressure squeeze pump that I'm going to squeeze here. And hopefully it's going to demonstrate. Come on, squeeze pump, you can do it. This poor old thing's been around the block a few times, a bit like me. And we say, oh, there we go. Look, we've got some bubbles. So bubbling, showing very low pressure is being forced through from below. And we're still not seeing anything drip through, are we, front rowers? So that's how these things work. Um, they work like a raincoat that breathes from the inside. Actually, somebody should make raincoats out of these because my biggest you know, thing I hate about raincoats is you get so sweaty in them. So I don't think I might be able to a new product. Goodbye, WeatherTech's hollow raincoats. <laughs> and luckily, these plants need a drink because this thing leaks like a sieve. So that's how they work. It is a, a raincoat that breathes from the inside. So our first step in our two-step design solution is to get rid of the old sarkings and use a vapour permeable membrane. And we're back to our model and we can see here we've got our lining, our studs, our um, bulk insulation, our vapour permeable membrane. We now want to create a new zone in our wall system. We need to create a new zone which is cooler than the rest of the wall system. And that zone needs to be on the outside of the sarking and behind the cladding. So in order to create that space, what do we need to add next before the cladding goes on? Battens, thank you. So we add our battens, and these are sh this is showing quite a thick batten, but it only needs to be nine millimetres deep as a minimum. And so we're only adding nine millimetres to the thickness of the wall, which is important, I think, because especially in Sydney, where real estate prices are ridiculous, or anywhere in Australia for the, that matter these days, even where I live is crazy. Um, so yeah, you're only adding nine mil, um, you're not creating a, a much, much thicker wall. Then we add our cladding. So what happens now is vapour pressure is higher in the inside, it pushes through the surprisingly permeable plasterboard, it also pushes through the um, insulation, the bulk insulation, our membrane is the best breather out of all these materials. It gets into this zone here, hits the back of the cladding where it's colder, and that's where it condenses and runs down and drains out the bottom or evaporates. And if you're concerned about that gap and you're concerned about nine mil vermin getting in there, there are accessories. We have an accessory called a cavity closer, and it's like a U-channel with machined little holes in it, which will still allow air to go in and water to drain out. Um, and only the smallest vermin like ants would be able to get in, maybe baby cockroaches, but certainly mice and things like that wouldn't be able to get in there and breed. So that is the second step. After a vapour permeable membrane, we put our cavity battens on and hey presto. I am told by a, an architect who I presented this to about two years ago now, and she was from America, and she said, yes, this is what we've been doing in the States for about the last 30 years. We had the same problem over there, and um, th that's exactly how they've addressed it over there. So there you go. It obviously works. So what does the recently updated NCC require? And it's about to be updated again next year, and this is going to be changed slightly again. So without reading all of that, those words, if we come to this climate zone map and we see climate zone 6, 7, and 8... So climate zone six, seven, and eight are light blue, dark blue, and white. So you can see it's sort of more the south areas. Tassie's made up of seven and eight in total, and we get some climate zone six over on the west, West Australia coast. Uh, but Thornley is climate zone six. It's still part of Sydney, just, um, but it's uh, about 30 kilometres from the coast. And so, you know, Borkham Hills, Castle Hill, Campbelltown, Liverpool, those places that are about 30 odd k's from the coast, they're going to be climate zone six. Um, they now must have vapour permeable membranes as a minimum standard requirement to meet the NCC on class one, ten, class one buildings. Um, so that's what they're, they're calling up. In Tasmania, in their BCA, they also call up the cavity battens as well, but the cavity battens are optional. We believe at WeatherTechs that you should just use cavity battens and we believe at WeatherTechs that you should use a vapour permeable membrane wherever you are except for climate zone one, which is the tropics. They have different problems up there. Um, but um, we uh, uh, basically say we want to see a vapour permeable membrane instead of a, an old sarking in all cases. And cavity battens are not compulsory, but let's do it, then that costs nothing, you know? When you look at the cost of building these days, it's, it's minimal. 
So, I mean, some of you guys are probably already doing this, are you? I mean, there's probably a, there's a lot of architects and building designers in the room who have been, probably been doing this for many years, even before it became part of the NCC. I believe what's going to be happening next year is climate zones four and five are going to be added. So that's going to be, uh, I think, pretty much um, uh, the bulk of Sydney. And we're, I mean, we'd have to zoom in on Sydney, but... I think Sydney's generally climate zone four, isn't it? Like the closer to the city. So it's going to become compulsory. Um, if you're going to have to do the vapour permeable membrane and the cost difference between it and a, a cheap sarking is, is negligible really in the scheme of a construction cost. And then the battens, well, you can use anything as a batten. You know, you could rip down studs. You could use WeatherTech's cavity battens, which is just a, a byproduct of our production and they're very cheap. So, R values. How are R values affected by this design solution? In fact, they're improved slightly. Basically, these types of membranes have a nil R value. Um, because they're thin, they don't have any bulk. They're not really going to give us any sort of insulation properties. We do get some R value from the still airspace uh, inside a cavity, and we'll get some R value from the actual components, so the internal lining, the external cladding and the studs will give us some R value as well. So we've got three scenarios to look at here. The first one, similar to the house I grew up in, we have a system R value of 0.47. So that's the cladding, the studs and the lining are giving us 0.47. And that airspace gives us a 0.43 of an R, giving us a total R value of 0.9. Uh, if we add R2 bulk insulation, our system is reduced ever so slightly, and the reason why it's reduced is because we're now bridging our internal and external materials, our internal lining and our external cladding. The back of both of those materials are being bridged. Even though it's being bridged by inst insulation, it's uh, still being bridged, so it drops it ever so slightly. We lose our airspace, but we gain two points from the R2 bulk insulation, so we get 2.3. If we add a 9 mil cavity, we get an additional 0.14 of an R, so it slightly improves things to have that little bit of extra air gap. And I'm told the deeper you make the cavity, the greater the positive influence on the R value will be up to a point. But let's face it, here in Sydney, we don't want to make our walls too thick. We want to basically keep them to a, um, a manageable thickness. So we might go to R 2.5, for instance, uh, for our insulation, for our bulk insulation. So this image, slightly out of focus to make it look even more sinister, but this is a uh, picture and I'm told that this photo was taken in New Zealand uh, of uh, internal linings removed and you can see why they thought it was a building leak because there's a huge amount of mould there. I'm still not convinced that this is from condensation, but anyway, let's assume it is. It's, whether it's from condensation or a leak, we don't want mould inside our buildings and this is not healthy at all. The reason why it's a bigger problem in New Zealand than it is, say, in Sydney is because of climate. New Zealand has a colder, wetter climate than we have. They do a lot more heating over there as well than we do. So their conditions for this situation are um, uh, worse. I've just come back from the Central West last week and did this presentation, and apparently they see this problem in the Central West quite a bit as well, because they have cold winters over there. They do artificial heating, and uh, you know it's, it's something which I think is more prevalent in those sorts of climates. So, does anyone have any questions? The gentleman that asked about this topic before, did that address some of the questions you had? Oh, good. And, um, all right, well, if there are no questions, we will go through the formal questionnaire. So you all should have your questionnaire. Again, like last time, I'll read out the question and then you guys can call out A, B, C or D. So, number one, name a risk and or possible damage brought about by condensation. All of the above, yeah, so I won't read them all out, but we've already been over them. So the answer to question two, there's only one answer. It's A, B, C or D, okay? So it's not A and B or C and D or whatever, it's just one. Name two ways by which water vapour may enter wall cavities. B, yes, diffusion through plasterboard and air leakage through holes in wall lining. Uh, number three, vapour pressure is typically higher inside than outside. True, A, correct. Uh, number four, which, vapor, uh, which material has the lowest vapour resistance? C, vapour permeable membrane. Number five, which of the following construction systems has the highest R value? C, vapour permeable membrane with R2 bulk insulation and a 9mm cavity. 
Number six, how can the R value of bulk insulated wall, bulk insulated wall with vapour permeable membrane be increased? B, yes, addition of cavity battens before installation of the cladding. And from 2000 on, I don't know, was it, was it 1999 that they introduced all this stuff? I can't, maybe it was 2000, I don't know, but um, the requirements for insulation increased, I think not only in New South Wales, but across Australia, so I think we know that's true. And number eight, the increase in bulk insulation and air tightness has contributed to concealed condensation and mould problems. True. And number nine, increases, uh, excuse me, issues contributing to concealed mould in wall cavities include reduced air circulation, increased uh, condensation, addition of bulk insulation, so it must be D, all of the above, and vapour permeable membranes, cavity battens, panels and weatherboards assist in reducing interstitial mould and concealed condensation by providing a more permeable sarking layer, providing an additional air gap in the wall system, allowing free draining and evaporation of moisture from the wall. So that must be D, all of the above. So there you go, you all got 10 out of 10, congratulations. Hang on to those quizzes in case you do get audited by the ARB or the B, what is it, BD? Anyway, the Building Design Association, BDAA. Um, and yes, if anyone would like any uh, information about this topic or any of the topics that we've talked about today, I will leave some business cards over there on that little table for you. Please grab a card, drop me a line. Gentleman's got his hand up. So top hats or furring channel, that type of thing. Um, Generally speaking, if you're using metal battens, you've probably got a metal stud as well. And on a class one, one like house, you would need a thermal break. So you could use a top hat, but you'd need to also have some way of stopping energy transfer from your lining through to your, uh, sorry, from the cladding through to the lining. So the short answer is yes, you can, but you need a thermal break in there as well. What we're, we're doing a lot of Hungry Jacks projects at the moment with WeatherTechs, um, and they have top hats, but being a class six sort of retail hospitality project, they don't need to have a, th uh, they do need to have a thermal break, but the actual top hat itself in that class of building is regarded as sufficient thermal break, whereas I don't believe it's sufficient in the class one. So the other thing to consider as well, I know there's lots of um, issues at the moment around getting timber framing for houses. Um, and I know a lot of people are going across to steel for that reason. But once things get back into equilibrium, if you can use timber, and I'm not talking about cladding here, I'm talking about framing. If you can use timber framing over steel, if you can use timber flooring over ceramic tiles, if you can use timber in any uh, application, timber frame windows over aluminium, and the timber is sustainably harvested, as all timber must be in Australia now, you're doing the environment a favour. So sustainably harvested timber is carbon negative. It stores more carbon than is produced in its manufacture. It is so much better for the environment than steel or aluminium or concrete or ceramic tiles or whatever. So if you can use timber in your specifications, uh, it is um, doing the environment a big favour. So keep that in mind. Yes. Um, well, I guess that could be something that you could do. Whether or not that's going to be effective inside a cavity wall that's stuffed with bulk insulation, because your air movement within there, which is what a fan is relying on, is going to be restricted because of the insulation. So I think that if you've got this problem, you probably would need to um, remove the cladding and put the sarking back on, put battens on, and often if the cladding is removed carefully, you can often reuse it. Um, you might need to replace some of it, but you can, you can sometimes reuse it. If you did have to replace it, of course, you could use WeatherTechs, but you know, that's just me getting a plug in. Um, but yeah, I don't know that, that I know in passive houses, uh, mechanical ventilation is very important. As, as part of the, the way the whole system works. And passive house wall design is streets ahead of what we've talked about here. Um, they have multiple layers and the walls end up being quite thick due to all of the insulation. But also understand that you virtually have no heating or cooling ever required in a passive house. And the air is circulated not only through the house itself, but also through the wall systems. So it can be part of the solution. But I think when we're talking about very simple models like we talked about today, I don't think it would work. 
Yes. Um, as far as, uh, well, roofs are not an area that I get involved with. We actually did a symposium here with um, Deborah and the gang uh, back in 2018, and it was called Breaking the Mould, and we had uh, professors and all sorts of amazing bigwigs. I refused to present that day because I said, I'm not following a professor. But we also had a company here called... Oh, what were they called? What were they called? I, I always have trouble remembering their name, but the company is Melbourne-based and they specialise in everything to do with insulation. Proclimer, P-R-O, new word, C-L-I-M-A. Talk to Proclimer. The people from Proclimer, Pro I thought outshone a lot of the other people that presented that day because they have products and solutions for... My house that I live in has raked ceilings and I used an anti-con blanket on recommendation of my builder, but Pro Climber claims, and they showed in their presentation, that anti-con blankets actually cause more condensation than they prevent. And they go for a different type of insulation system, which actually includes mechanical ventilation, even in rake ceilings. So I'm not a, I'm, I'm, I like to think I've got a lot more knowledge on wall systems due to my relationship with cladding. Um, but if you talk to ProClimber, they should be able to give you some good advice. Anybody else? So do you think that one was more interesting the NC than the NCC one? I think it is. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention, everybody. I'll leave some cards over there. And um, please reach out if you need a hand. Beautiful. Thank you.